Did you know that we have channel memberships now? If you'd like to help support this channel, get some exclusive Koobana emotes to use in the comments, as well as an exclusive badge by your name, click that join button now to find out more. Every bit of support really helps. Thanks guys. On January 22nd, 1979, a 27-year-old woman's dead body was found in a plastic greenhouse in Kaizuka City, Osaka Prefecture. She had been attacked and beaten, but police were at a loss as to who may have committed the crime. As such, the woman's husband decided that he would take the law into his own hands and find the killer himself, leading to one of the most grossly mishandled cases in Japanese history. How so? Let's take a look. Early in the morning of January 22nd, a Kaizuka resident found the body of a woman in his plastic greenhouse. He immediately called the police, and her time of death was estimated to be roughly 6pm the previous night, due to asphyxiation. Police were unable to identify the woman due to a lack of personal effects, but the next morning, January 23rd, they received a phone call from a man claiming to be her husband. His wife had gone to visit her parents in Itami, but had yet to return home, and he learned of the incident after seeing it in the newspaper that morning. It turned out the woman was indeed his wife, and she was three months pregnant at the time. Police set about conducting a wide-scale investigation, interviewing all local residents and collecting anything that might be used as evidence from the site. But the woman's husband was understandably livid at what had happened. He was unable to let the police handle matters themselves and took it upon himself to find the killer as well. As you can no doubt imagine, this didn't go so well. The man immediately set his sights on an 18-year-old boy he knew from nearby. This 18-year-old was known as a bit of a delinquent and was acquainted with both the husband and wife. When the husband ran into the boy on the street shortly after his wife's death, the teenager reportedly turned his gaze away from the man, and that was enough for something inside the husband to snap. He figured the boy had to be hiding something, and so he grabbed him, took him to a nearby beach, and interrogated him with force. Unable to take it any longer, the teenager confessed that, yes, it was he who did it. Satisfied that he had found the criminal, the husband took the boy to the police, alongside his forced confession. Up until this point, the husband's actions could easily be chalked up to those of a heartbroken man. His wife had been taken unceremoniously from him, and naturally, he wanted revenge. However, at this point, you might also suspect that the police, being handed a clearly injured teen confessing to a crime committed against the wife of the man handing him in, that they might want to investigate it a little further themselves for validity. And that's where this case took a nosedive. They didn't. The police took the husband's word without bothering to investigate the veracity of his claims for themselves and arrested the teen. They then interrogated the boy themselves and decided that another four of his friends must have been accomplices. The four friends were promptly arrested as well. As this was going on, DNA was extracted from the crime scene, believed to belong to the killer. All five teens were tested and perhaps unsurprisingly to everyone listening to this, none of them matched. Not a single one. Their shoes were also tested for soil found at the scene and no matches made. Nor did any fingerprints or palm prints match. At this point, again, you would imagine that the police would have realised they were wrong and let those charged go. But they did not. It's unknown what went on behind the scenes, but police decided to continue charging the youths regardless and all five were sent to trial. Most egregious of all, 
police refused to inform the media of this evidence and simply pretended that it didn't exist in the first place. Perhaps even more surprisingly, all five suspects were convicted in their first trial. They each claimed that police had tortured false confessions out of them and that there was zero evidence linking them to the crime. And yet, on December 23rd, 1982, almost four years after the crime took place, all five suspects, now in their early 20s, were convicted. The eldest suspect was sentenced to 18 years prison, whilst the others received 10-year sentences. Four of the young men appealed and were eventually acquitted on January 30th, 1986, almost seven years to the day after the crime took place. Discrepancies in statements and lack of evidence were finally taken into account during their retrial, and thus their sentences were overturned. They were greatly helped by an investigation conducted by the Yomiuri Shimbun that uncovered clear inconsistencies and proof that police had hidden evidence that would have cleared the suspect's names. The first youth who was interrogated by the husband, however, initially refused to appeal. It turned out that he came from a poor family, and he didn't want to drag the trial out any further because he didn't wish to burden his family with the financial strain. He didn't think his conviction would be overturned on appeal anyway, so he decided to simply accept his fate and place as little burden on his family as possible. Yet once he learned that his friend's sentences had been overturned, he requested a retrial as well. On March 2nd, 1989, a decade after the crime took place, the final man's sentence was also overturned, and he was freed. All five suspects were now free and had been judged not guilty under the eyes of the law. That, however, still left one big question hanging in the air. If it wasn't them, then who did it? To this day, the crime remains unsolved. Police stopped investigating the case after the trial, and that was that. The case was grossly mishandled from start to finish, and because police initially suspected that numerous people were involved, when presented with a local delinquent, they decided that it had to be him and his friends, and forced matters to fit their idea of what happened, even when all the evidence on hand contradicted that. Five young men spent several years behind bars for a crime they didn't commit, while the real killer, or killers, remained free. All because authorities couldn't be bothered to conduct a proper investigation. But what do you guys think of this one? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you again next time.